here. Um, happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on creating new nonprofit business models in a COVID-19 world. My name is Emily Scahill. I'm the Manager of Peer Advocacy, Supports, and Services at MHA's National Office, and I will be moderating today's webinar. So notes before we get started, we are recording this webinar and we'll send it out along with the slides afterwards, so no worries if you have to step out for a bit. We've also built in some time for a Q&A at the end, so in your start meeting window, there's a chat bubble which you can click on to open up the messaging window. Feel free to drop any questions in there and we'll go through some at the end. Same thing if you run into any tech issues, I'll be monitoring that, so toss them in there. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce you all to Mike Rose, today's presenter. Mike Rose is the CEO of the Mental Health Association Oklahoma. Throughout his 27 years in the position, he has worked to ensure MHAO has a reputation for bringing community partners together to tackle difficult issues related to mental illness, suicide, homelessness, and incarceration. He started his career at MHAO with just five employees. Today, MHAO boasts approximately 180 staff members in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Under Mike's leadership, MHAO's housing portfolio has grown from just 11 beds in 1991 to its current 1,433 units of affordable housing in Tulsa and 133 units in Oklahoma City. Throughout his social work career, Mike has modeled to students that when systems fail people affected by mental illness and homelessness, they shouldn't be afraid to challenge the system and advocate for more just and dignified systems. In recognition of his service, Mike was inducted into the Social Work Hall of Fame at both Oral Roberts University and the University of Oklahoma's Anne and Henry Zero School of Social Work. So with that, I will turn it over to Mike to get us started. Hey, thanks, Emily. I'm just thrilled to be asked to <clears throat> share some information uh, to uh, the participants in the webinar and welcome to you all. And uh, hopefully everybody is safe safe and healthy as well as your staff. So anyway, we'll go ahead and go to the first slide there and uh, get started. Um, and uh, Emily, I think you're operating that. So there we go. Okay. So uh, just the first slide is really about, um, you know, the law of equifinality. And, I, you know, I've been a lifelong, career-long student of uh, systems theory, general systems theory, uh, as well as family systems theory. And of course, early on discovered that in general systems theory uh, is that the whole idea behind it is that all systems, whatever they are, uh, at the micro, meso, macro levels, they all work under very similar principles that you find in general systems theory. And one of those concepts is the law of equifinality. And so, you know, observing human nature, it seems like our human nature, guys, is that we tend to often lock down on there's one way uh, to accomplish something, and uh, there are actually – uh, in the law of equifinality says there are many, many ways to accomplish the same outcomes. Uh, and right now in COVID-19 world, uh, really early on, and I'm sure most of the, the participants here on this webinar, hopefully you've moved past uh, the whole term of shutdown. That is a term that I've um, challenged internally within our organization uh, in, the, in the, the alterations that we've had to make in our operations in COVID-19, uh, but shutdown isn't an option. And uh, everywhere, anywhere you look, businesses are creating new business models to survive. I mean, I've been hearing about, uh, you know, uh, um, restaurants uh, selling groceries. Um, you hear about, uh, you know, how, you know, curbside delivery. Uh, we've all heard this. Uh, it's all over everywhere. And we as nonprofits are really no different. We are businesses. And I know that you all hear us. We hear people say, uh, sometimes I'll have business people on boards that are coming under our board or come and take tours of our housing and I get to talk to them and they'll make reference. Well, we're in, you know, I'm in the business uh, sector. Uh, you're in the nonprofit and the implication there is not, we're, we're not real businesses. Oh, there's nobody probably on this call, on this webinar didn't know we are businesses. Yeah, so uh, different strokes for different folks. I know uh, uh, I've been accused many times of, um, uh, you know, kind of country sayings um, out here in Oklahoma. 
uh, and grew up in Kansas out there in the, in the, uh, in the southwest part of the state. And we use those kind of different expressions. But, you know, MHAs and other nonprofit representatives are on this webinar. We're all unique and different. We're big, we're small, we're medium sized. Um, we've been, in, uh, as you just heard in my introduction there, we were small and then suddenly we woke up one day and we were medium sized and now we, you know, now we operate with a $19 million annual budget and I'm sure some of you out there are much even much bigger than that but a lot of you may be small and I don't think this um, it, it makes a difference uh, we're all in where we are so uh, some of us are uh, like MHAs are focused primarily on state houses and legislation uh, some are focused on different forms of advocacy and education and some are where some of us are on the on the webinar on the webinar are involved in various forms of service delivery um, models and and some of us are all of the above I know we we, we check most of those boxes um, in our operations but not everybody's that way but again I think what you're going to hear regardless of what you do what your uh, uh, what your um, your your deliverables are your product line is um, uh, these things that you're going to hear in the in the webinar, I think, apply to all of us in a COVID-19 world. So we'll uh, so different strokes for different folks. Okay. So one of the things that I like to talk about sometimes is working backwards when we're confronted from a management senior management situation. We're 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 confronted with a problem. Sometimes we'll work. Uh, forward is what I call that. But sometimes we need to go, we need to work backwards. Uh, and in COVID-19, by the way, retreat is actually a tactic. And for those of you that have been involved in the military or familiar with military uh, parlance and strategy, retreat is a really is actually a um, is a tactic and anytime that you're confronted with an opponent or a problem or a situation that you uh, you or your organization is unsure about uh, the uh, you know uh, the cost or the the opponent or the problem uh, and you're not sure about what you're dealing with COVID-19 uh, was certainly uh, re, uh, met that criteria, um, we as an organization, we chose very early on, and we actually have gotten feedback from our community and state, uh, other nonprofits, that we were a real trendsetter in terms of retreating, pulling back, uh, and from normal working conditions. But then we began to focus, what are our deliverables? What is it that we normally every day deliver and what are those things that we really need to be focused in on? How do we maintain those? And I called it early on these two lines that intersect. How does safety uh, and protecting our staff and providing and, and maintaining our current product line, where do those lines meet and cross each other and how do we deal that? From very, very early on, we focused on keeping our, 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 our staff safe, our clients safe, uh, our patrons, collaborators. We really, really went very early on. We went into um, uh, to uh, and on non-essential staff. We identified those very early, and then we went to non-essential. We went to um, uh, you know safety and distancing and remote operations. Um, and I'm sure many of you did the same thing. And again, very quickly, technology, technology, technology became our biggest friend. Can you imagine? I'm sure you guys have had the same conversation we've had. What if we did not have this technology? You talk about shut down. Many of us would be probably completely shut down or putting ourselves and our staffs at much greater risk than what we are right now already. So again, Hey, I'm self-confession. Uh, my assistant is on this webinar, and she's got a big grin on her face because she knows it was three weeks ago. I had no idea how to set up a Zoom call, a Hangout call, Skype, uh, any meeting. 
she had to always do that for me, and I'd just walk in and do it and then walk out of the room, and I didn't know how it happened. She took care of it. Oh, now I can do all that. I've had to really uh, pick up my game, as I'm sure many of you are. We can't because some of our support staff are not as available to us for those kinds of things. Again, we also focused in on internal communication and planning. Again, it was done virtually. We began to talk and get on calls. I'm sure many of you are been on tons, hundreds of calls uh, and Zooms and um, conference calls. Uh, and we started doing really, I called it, I'm a big, I'm an old school guy, whiteboard. I still love the whiteboard. When we got our new location, uh, I knew we had all these smart boards and a technology, but I wanted some old fashioned whiteboards because I, that's a lot of times, is getting the, the group together. So we really, challenged our, our our direct line staff. Again, guys, uh, I don't have to remind, I hope most of you guys on this webinar, I've said it for all 40 years of my career, the best ideas always come from the staff, line staff up. Uh, we think a lot of times as senior managers, it's, it's top down. There is a top down process and there's certainly a way. One of the biggest things is a top top-down thing that we put out is safety parameters. We put those parameters, and we said within those parameters, how can you guys as direct service providers continue to serve your clients and in, 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 in bring home our deliverables and what have you? How can we do that? So what that did, that created a huge, really healthy, virtual, again, dialogue between um, uh, line staff and senior management. And a lot of times, I don't have to tell you guys, in larger organizations, sometimes that's a challenge for senior management to stay in contact and be in dialogue and help the line staff feel comfortable talking and speaking their mind and giving their opinions to senior management. And that's a, that's a cultural thing, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But, but I will point out that this has been a great opportunity to be actually silver linings, guys, building that culture. And then for us, you heard us, we're in Oklahoma City and in Tulsa. We struggle with communication, even though we have some exact same product lines in the two cities. We struggle with cross-communication. across. We call it across communication across the turnpike. And so the virtual aspect of it actually made that easier to do because we didn't have time and distance so much separated, we were able to do that. So those are those silver linings. So working backwards or using to retreat, retreating back in, and then coming out with new strategies, new tactics to be able to continue to serve the people that we serve in our various publics, as you're going to see. I'll talk about that and start to talk about that more in the next slide. Go ahead there, uh, Emily. So before I get to that, let's talk about money. Oh, my gosh. Uh, money is like gas in the car. You have no gas. You can have the most beautiful car. I've got a really lovely car sitting out there in my driveway right now. It hasn't been driven that much lately. Um, and But if it doesn't have gas in it, it ain't going to go anywhere. And money keeps our organizations running. And so I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I imagine everybody on this webinar now knows what PPP, Payroll Protection Plan, we've applied for it. We're waiting to hear. We know it's been accepted. We haven't seen the money show up in our bank account. We've done it. A lot of, I was on a webinar uh, uh, earlier this morning on uh, the use of uh, going after whether to go after the EIDL a uh, disaster loan there. Uh, we're looking at that. We right now delayed that. It doesn't matter uh, what we've done. Everybody's situation is unique and different. I know on that call about half the participants, almost almost really close to 90% had done payroll protection plan. About 50-50 had done the, the EIDL, the EIDL EIDL loan, and I'm sure a lot of you are having those conversations within your organization. Again, right now, you, the state and federal grant opportunities are coming out in rapid form. You've got to have either yourself or somebody in your organization who's watching for them very, very closely, getting them and processing them. We had a, a call at 8.30 this morning, a group of us on, trying to, to talk through. There was a federal grant housing-related uh, uh, rent support grant out there in our housing trying to decide did we want, was it in our interest to be able to apply for that or not? It's a very short turnaround. Uh, these aren't stretched out. They're getting that, those are getting out very fast, so you've got to be on top of that. It's interesting, private foundations, if you've not been in contact with private foundations to support you, put in the call, give them a call, tell them what you're doing. You've got to uh, have communication and update. And... Um, 
you know, again, uh, one of the messages for all of us here, guys, I, I hate this, but it's true. I've seen it all through my career. Crisis situations create financial opportunity on the short term. And we'll get to that later on the longer term. Uh, but um, uh, And also, right now, if you're not keeping track, work with your accountant. I'm not an accountant. I'm, not, I'm a social worker. Uh, if you're not keeping track of all COVID-19 related expenditures and losses, please do that. Uh, you need to do that because that's what funders private and some public are beginning to ask for. And certainly on those PPP and EIDL loans, those are uh, those are very careful, careful record keeping that keeps your nose clean and keeps your private foundations, private funders happy as they do that. You've got to tr- keep track of that right now. And I know our accounting office is watching that very, very carefully. And that's in our interest, but it's also an interest in people who might be out there able to help us uh, to keep that track of that. Okay, next slide there, Emily. This is a, pr- a primary, uh, uh, you know, again, I told you I'm kind of country. Uh, out of sight is out of mind. And uh, if you're not, if your committees, board, staff meetings, uh, we've had our executive committee um, met already virtually this the first one we did was just a conference call with everybody on there. Didn't know if it would work. It did. Now we're up to speed. We're doing Zoom. Board meeting is tomorrow. Staff meetings. We had a staff meeting uh, with 115 employees on our Zoom call two weeks ago, and we're, we've actually increased those. We usually do them once a month. Right now, with all the feelings of people feeling so isolated internally and out of touch, we're doing another one this Friday, and for right now, we're doing them every two two weeks. So. Uh, out of sight is out of mind, um, and I'm trying to participate in, po- in pop-up meetings. All kinds of meetings are popping up. Uh, our one of our senators is having regular uh, town hall meetings right now in COVID-19. Uh, uh, we're trying to participate in that. We're divided. I can't do them all. We're divided up, uh, doing different ones. Uh, identify your publics. Who who are your publics? That can be your funders, that can be the people you serve, that can be their families, uh, you know, that can be uh, government, uh, uh, businesses, donors, all those publics. Who are those donors and how do we connect with them? I've been going through slowly through my text contact list, particularly on weekends, and just going through there and anybody I see in my text list, I'm just sending them a message. Hey, Bill, thinking about you. Uh, how are you guys doing? Everybody safe at your house? And then I just copy and paste that one in, take out the first name, just do that. I'm working my way through my contact list. And, man, people appreciate that. FaceTime, video conference, email, phone. Um, you know, I'm not a big email guy. My, I, I don't really like email except for transferring documents, uh, 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 PowerPoints. Uh, you know, I like to text and phone. I like to do it in real time. But everybody's different. A lot of people love to email. I'm not an email guy. My assistant helps me with my email. Email, I can set and do email all day long, and the more I do, the more comes back at me. So I try to stay away from that, but it is an important part of our world. Reach out. Don't wait for them to contact you. Reach out to your partners, your donors, your supporters. Let them about know about the new business model and how you're delivering services, the new models you're using, and be sure and let them know about any programs that are shut down. We have two peer-run drop-in centers, one in Oklahoma City, one in Tulsa. We had to shut, we shut them down, and they're still shut down. And but we've told our donors, we've told our, our you know, that's funded by the Oklahoma. Uh, those programs are funded by the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health in substance abuse services we have let we were in communication with them immediately telling them that we had shut them down and why we had shut them down and um, we have really good reasons to do that because we don't feel like we're equipped or have the training for that staff who are peer run it's a peer run and it really gets very very crowded a lot of people are homeless come into those properties we're not really set up now will will it when and will it will they reopen they will we don't know when yet. We're monitoring that very closely. But our donors, even our our state funder, very supportive. Now, 
we did redeploy that staff, and we've got that staff and those and those drop-in centers reconnected up with our homeless outreach teams, which actually are our re, our homeless outreach teams that we have in both cities have redeployed. And then doing communiques, I've done two major communiques with supporters. I need to get a third one out. Just telling all of our supporters, blind copying that to a lot of people. What's going on? Here's a state of the organization, state of the state, state of the union, state of the organization to our supporters about what's going on. Out of sight is out of mind. Don't be out of sight right now. Push yourself out there, okay? Uh, examples of new business models. Now, these are examples that we've done. Uh, don't, don't translate. It's not an apples-to-apples -apples translation. Translate it to what you're, again, that goes back to that earlier slide. What did I, what is our current deliverables and how do we redesign them or create new ones? So, uh, right away, we created a huge safety plan. I referenced that earlier. Protocols for all staff, essential and non-essential. Uh, essential, we've got 24-7 housing, three 24-7 housing properties. We are absolutely, I'm not exaggerating here, I hate to be, we're terrified that if, if we get a positive in there, we did have one key staff member who's all around those positives, uh, who tested positive. Uh, he is home and recovered, and believe it or not, he is back to work, and his wife, who also works for us, who's pregnant, didn't has not gotten it. She's been quarantined. She's back at work. We missed a bullet right by went by, by us, and but we continue to really, really stress over that. And I know a lot of you ha are familiar with nursing facilities where it's gotten inside those, probably brought in from outside, and it spreads all over the place. It's very terrifying. So we've had really straight uh, protocols. One of the things we got staff feedback from our staff. We would like plexiglass around the desk. We contacted a, a contractor. It wasn't cheap. We felt like it was good money. Uh, we, we built these plexiglass clear barriers around our desks for our 24-7 properties, and you'd amazing is that how much that calmed the staff down, made them feel better. They're wearing masks all the time. They're wearing gloves uh, all the time. Um, Again, I already mentioned some of your programs may have to be shelved temporarily during this pandemic. Uh, we set up uh, our – somebody said, oh, man, there goes our support groups. We said, what about our support groups going viral? Silver lining? Suddenly, we put that out, and I'll get into that in a minute, but, man, we got huge – we pushed that out publicly, and we had media – all kinds of media calls, and I'll give you some numbers on that in a little bit. And we were able – and we realized by going virtual – uh, our support group leaders could continue to lead the support group safely, and it allowed a lot more people from a much larger area to participate with our, our regular support groups. And those are, you know, anxiety support group, depression support group, survivors of suicide, bipolar support group, um, and so, and, and there are others. Then after we got those stabilized, then we said, let's roll out some temporary support groups on coping with COVID-19, uh, coping for the general public. We offer, we offer one now for first responders, uh, those for, you know, essential employees are out there in the front line. So those, those precious, uh, food stockers and uh, checkers at the grocery store who put their, are putting themselves at risk so we can have food and all down the food chain, uh, those kind of people who we can offer them also specialized support groups. And we've been rolling those out. Again, the media is eating that up. They want to know all about that. And then we've continued. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but we've really struggled, but we're continuing to house people during the crisis. Homeless outreach teams have been redeployed. <clears throat> we're helping work working with our partners. Excuse me. <clears throat> we're working with our partners to deploy them to encampments, uh, dropping off uh, food, uh, water, uh, med medicines. Um, I don't know about you and your communities um, in Oklahoma here, and I know other cities have done this, where we work closely and communicate with our law enforcement. Don't be breaking up those encampments right now. We need those people to self-isolate, which is completely, totally upside down, inside out, backwards from how we normally think about encampments. We're trying to normally get people out of those encampments, into the shelters, where we can engage them. Right now, uh, that's not really the strategy, which is very strange to me. It's really, I really had to be educated on that by our, by the homeless outreach team people about how that works. So that's a whole different new business model that we're working off right now. Go ahead, Emily. 
uh, podcasting and media relations. Um, <clears throat> and again, podcast gone wild. I don't know how many of you have your own podcast. We've had ours for going on two years now. Now, all of last year was our first full year of 2019 was our first full year of utilizing our podcast. Our total amount of downloads, by the way, if you're interested, it's called Mental Health Download. <clears throat> it's on all the platforms. You can get that. Excuse me. I've got to drink of water here. Hold on. Sorry about that. Um, podcast gone wild, and this year, 10,000 last year total downloads. This year, since January 1, we're at over 15,000 downloads, and the majority of those have been since March 1, and that's because we started doing one pod, went from one podcast release a, a, a week to almost one a day or one every other day <clears throat> on all kinds of topics COVID-19 related. People want to know about it. Changing our business model. Um, um, all you know, please. I'm sure. I'm sure the people on this webinar know this. Accept all media requests. <clears throat> if you can't do it yourself, help them find somebody else. We've been really busy framing the story. Uh, you heard early on universal health precautions. Universal health precautions. We coined universal mental health precautions. What is that? Good nutrition. Um, good. Uh, getting your exercise, finding ways to exercise at home if you're at home, um, getting your rest. Many of us are having trouble sleeping, trying to get your rest, and not a good time to abuse alcohol, other substances prescribed or otherwise. So we've been touting universal mental health precautions. It's really interesting. People really take to that. <clears throat> We're talking about significantly impacting the mentally ill. That hey, duh. Where a lot of us are saying on the on the webinar, yeah. But a lot of people want to know about that. That's framing that to the media. Uh, everyone, kind of the general public, everyone's being traumatized by this, and it we don't know. But this very likely will have possible long lasting emotional impact on people. Um, I think I can make a case that uh, we're going to be watching for increases in agoraphobia cases, a panic disorder, um, obsessive compulsive. My, I'm struggling with hand washing right now. Uh, and then our message is coping with COVID. That's our overall message is trying to, so we're trying to frame the story to the media and they are, they're looking for those stories right now. And one of the, our early podcasts was, we called it, when does social distancing become social isolation? I don't know about you guys. Our office is empty. I went to the office yesterday. I had my mask on. I had my gloves on. I went in there. I just needed to sit at my desk. I hadn't been in there in three weeks. I needed to water my plants. Uh, you know, my dog wanted me out of the house. Uh, you know, um, but uh, I felt that social isolation. I think a lot of people are beginning to feel that. This is a great chance to use media outreach and tell our stories about that. And, again, that, that goes for if you're a provider on this or you're a mental health education, mental health advocacy, if you're an MHA, whatever your, whatever your business model is, uh, that's a real issue for all of us internally as well as communicating that externally. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, barriers to implementation, everything I've talked about. I'm sure a lot of you are going, yeah, well, that's good. <clears throat> but that won't work for us. Okay, I get it. Every call I'm on, and I'm sure it's the same with you guys, what are your needs? You know, state officials, public health officials, um, nonprofit support centers, United Ways. What's your biggest need? Personal protection equipment. Gloves, masks. Uh, progress is being made. <clears throat> we have 20 in 95s left. We've set that aside. We've got our staff, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm having trouble with my allergies. Our staff um, are using cloth mask and nursing mask. We saved the N95s for a staff member who's sick, having other kinds of symptoms, not, in, not COVID-19, but other sorts of illnesses, colds, um, or if we do have a positive within our housing, we are holding those N95s back for those residents who we're going to need to <clears throat> quarantine. <clears throat> so 
So lack of technology or skill sets with technology. Um, some of us have the technology, but we might not have the skill sets internally. Go outside and find that. Lack of technology. Look for help in getting the technology you need. I, if you're on this webinar, chances are you have the technology to do everything that I've been talking about. But some of us are having to learn. I told you about my learning curve. But yesterday I had to call our IT guy. Uh, at, uh, I ran into a problem. I could not dig my way out of it. I tried everything. It was interesting because I was kind of excited because a lot of the early things he tried, uh, I had already tried, but then it got to a point he had to actually look it up and go to one of his resources to find the, the answer to what I was running up against. Um, st staff with underlying conditions, guys. We've had some staff who said, I am not comfortable doing what I normally do because I have an underlying. What are those underlying conditions? In, in mental health uh, circles, we know a lot of our people, about half of our employees live in recovery, just 180, do the math. Uh, what are their underlying conditions? COPD, diabetes, obesity, uh, hep C, uh, HIV positive. Uh, those are things that you guys are all familiar with, and we need to be real sensitive to our staff. We have staff that are very dedicated. They're good soldiers, but we have to be very, very careful about what, we're, what kind of risk we're presenting to them. Uh, we've not laid anybody off. We told them that. We have no plans to do that. We're pay, that's why we're applying for that payroll protection plan. Fear of infection. Man, we've got people who have just, they're terrified of being infected, infecting their families. Uh, by the way, I'm terrified about that. I don't want to see any of my staff. I don't want to see, I don't want to be infected. I don't want to, because if I get infected, I might, I might pass that on to you, and I might pass it on to my family. I might pass it on to somebody else. And we know one of the key things about this, this COVID-19 if you're not familiar with this, I heard uh, no offense to anybody from Georgia, but uh, I was shocked to hear about a week or so ago the governor of Georgia woke up one day and discovered that he had figured out that uh, people who were asymptomatic could spread it. He did not know that. I didn't know where he's been, but that's what he said. But I do really have find there's still, my wife told me in her office that she talked to somebody just yesterday and had no idea that you could spread it asymptomatic. you got to know that. And that really has to guide. And I don't know if you guys have heard that. I thought the Surgeon General, one of the best things he ever said, all of us have to act like we actually are infected. And, and that's how you stop the spread. Self-care, guys. If we wear down, we get COVID-19, we're not going to be able to help anybody. That's been one of our also watchwords through this. But also, I'm just talking about, that, again, back to that universal mental health precaution. We've got to take care of ourselves. And I know I talk to people all the time. They're saying the same thing. I have never worked so hard in my life. I'm exhausted. And, and then we're working on weekends. You got, we have got to take care of ourselves and we've got to send that, we've got to do it and we've got to send that message out to our staff because they can't serve and do all the things I'm talking about on this webinar unless we're doing that also. Again, staffing availability. Some of you have very small staffs. Some of you may be one person offices. Uh, or, you know, there's only a few of you. And, uh, you know, again, that's a big advantage that, that we have and, and that we have lots of, of, of diversification and lots of specialty areas. Some of you on this webinar don't have that, and I want to be sensitive about that. And, and those are legitimate barriers to implementation. So go ahead there, Emily. Can do. This is a can do attitude. Again, it kind of goes back to what I, it reconnects with uh, um, what I had said earlier about the law of equifinality. <clears throat> we can do this. There are many, many ways that you accomplish the same thing. And you have to really, as leaders, and I would assume, I don't know, but I would assume a lot of people on this call are leaders within your organization. You have, we have to all have a can-do attitude within the safety parameters that we have set forth within our organizations. Again, partnering. <clears throat> I'm, I usually, we have an organization, a non another nonprofit, here in the state called the Center for Nonprofit Management, who are fabulous. They have actually offices in our building, and then they're very big in Oklahoma City. They're actually uh, bigger in Oklahoma City, but they cover the whole state supporting nonprofits as a nonprofit themselves. 
in all honesty, guys, I'm just being completely honest. I love that organization. I know the director, uh, their number two guy, uh, the office is in our building. He's a, they're fabulous. They do incredible work. We try to get people and our staff on there, what have you. Do I get on there very often, normally? No. I've been on every one of their calls, and I was on one this morning, and getting lots and lots of information. They're doing great. If you have those type of organizations in your state or in your community, put get on their list so you can get on those calls because information, this is very, very fast-moving stream. It's changing. Right now, pay attention to Horizon Trends. There was a conference call that they were – the Center for uh, Nonprofit, Nonprofit – yeah, I could one of our managers uh, is out. What? Open it. Ready in this open. Man, I think we're um, but start that they're gonna have. What is for? Look on community in a emerging stories we have to be very it's a very very fast moving i don't i don't think i have to tell you guys and emphasize that too much but we have to play very very att- much attention on the horizon trends um, and again as i said earlier sadly we learned it over and over here in oklahoma oklahoma city bombing tornadoes d- d- severe f5 damages people killed uh for uh, fires uh um you know uh, flooding, uh, and sadly, crisis breeds opportunity. But we have to be willing to step into that uh, into that realm. And we have a saying at Mental Health Association Oklahoma. Uh, we end every one of our all staff meetings. Uh, it's called "Go Do Good Things," and it's kind of a, a, one of our our mantras that we have as we break up our different gatherings. And now I add to it: "Go do good things safely." So, anyway, I know I'm a little bit ahead there, Emily, uh, but we can maybe give us some more time for Q&A, and, um, and we can open that up, and uh, anybody that has some questions that they want to ask about, I see there are quite a few, but I think you're going to facilitate that, uh, Emily, on that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, we only have one so far, um, but someone was asking about company culture and keeping morale up during this time from a leadership perspective? Great question. Uh, morale, uh, I've, asked, uh, I've asked my chiefs under me. I've asked the uh, directors under them, uh, what is morale like in your area, what have you. Don't wait to hear. Reach out to those. Call, get your groups together virtually. Call them individually. Check on them. See what they're doing. I think one of the best ways to right now is to address morale is about, uh, um, you know, taking the initiative to check on them and see how they're doing, not once, but regularly. I know I've still got a couple of three people that I've been asked to contact in the organization. And, you know, we're big enough, 180 people, it goes three, four layers down. And so most of those people I know, but not everybody, but um, this is a good chance for me to get to know them. And forget a call from me. Man, I, I get feedback. The direct service staff, guess who called me? Mike, Mike Bros called me. Uh, wanted to know how I was doing. And they tell their coworkers, and that helps build that culture. So right now is one of the biggest ways you can really build morale and boost morale. And, again, I think if you're able to, to tell them either if you you know that you there's no plans to lay anybody off if you you know if you if that's not true you don't know what you're going to do be honest with them be honest with them if you had to lay people off you're going to try to encourage them to file for unemployment and we're going to hopefully bring you back in the future so those kinds of things great another one are the support groups only your existing support groups or are you partnering with other orgs to provide new support groups or creating your own new support groups Yes, great question. So the first thing we did, we took on getting the existing support groups back up and running. We have support groups existing. We've had most of these, I came 27 years ago. They, most of these were in existence when I came 27 years ago. Now, we have them new in Oklahoma City. We contract with local licensed clinicians to do those. We don't pay them much, but we do pay them. They meet twice a month. Uh, and again, our initial reaction, oh man, there, there goes the support groups. 
And we said, no, wait a minute. What if we did it virtually? And our IT guy stepped up and said, could we do that? Yeah, we could do that. Okay. So he pitched in. Our IT uh, uh, pitched in and helped us. And then we reached out to the support group leaders and said, hey, what if we did it this way? Are you game? We'll still pay you. All that. They were like, yeah, we'll do that. And we helped some of them with the technology. So our first thing was to get them up and stabilized and running. We did press releases. We could not believe it. I suspected it would go that way, but we had all kinds of media. Like Again, we're a small to medium market here, but we've got three networks. We've got publications of all types. Uh, they were contacting us. They wanted to know all about it. They wanted to get that out to their viewers, readers, listeners about the support groups. We've actually done podcasts with some of the support group leaders. What kind of things are you hearing on the support groups? Um, and then we, once we got those stabilized, we said, hey, what about let's do some offer some special time limited support groups? We reached out to some of our clinic, clinical friends again and said, hey, what would you be willing to do this if we offer these, what have you? And they said, absolutely. So we've been rolling those out last week and this week and getting those support groups up and running. So those are new. Uh, and again, the media did press releases. They were all over that, wanted to know all about those, getting the word out, as well as giving us attention to what Mental Health Association Oklahoma is doing in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Our donors hear that. They like that. They nod their head. They're like, yeah, good. Uh, it works all the way around. And it really took a, a very little effort. You'd be amazed how easy that was actually able to do um, we were able to put those together really quickly. Great. And then we have another one. Um, if you could repeat what you had said about horizon trends and elaborate on that a bit more. Yeah, I mean, hopefully as the, the managers and the CEOs and the visionaries and that are on the on the webinar, you know, it's something we have to do every day. What are trying I always say I'm trying to see over the horizon. And, and within this shrunken period of COVID-19, so looking at, well, what's over the horizon? One is, I don't know about you guys, I'm watching the daily numbers from the city, county health department and the state health department about, uh, we still had yesterday 118 new confirmed infections. We're averaging about 100 a day. Um, and then, uh, sadly, also uh, the number of deaths, and we're watching that. And I, I sent out, a, I saw it charted on a line today. That line still in Oklahoma is still going straight up. Uh, but I have a really, really close friend in, um, who's an elected official, who's a lifelong friend in the Seattle area. And you guys may remember, Seattle was the first hot spot in the country uh, to really start to have the, the confirmed positives, and they got really hit. One of the nursing homes that got hit there very severely early on, had a lot of national media attention, was right in his town. And he's an elected official there. And so he's getting a lot of information. So we talk all the time, text, call, what have you, anyway, and then rapidly. So now he's been sending me the charts coming out of his area there in Shinomish County, uh, Washington State, and it's trending downward. Their numbers are coming way down. They're not close. To, they're not. They're not ready to open up. But so there's a trend. And we have estimated. Uh, he and I have sort of done our own calculations. We think that they're about three weeks behind us. I'm sorry. We're three weeks behind them in terms of the trends there and, and their impact of social distancing. I mean, he was telling me they were shut down as a city in Seattle area. We weren't even, I mean, shut down? What are you talking about? We're not shut down here in Tulsa and Oklahoma in a city. We're out doing our business. We're still going to the office. Uh, you know, two weeks later, <coughs> we were doing the same thing. So shelter in place. He was like, I said, I said, you guys are all sheltering in place. That's the order. Yes. Wow. Okay, so now we've got to be looking ahead, what are those trends, and we've got to anticipate those in terms of our product lines, our service delivery. And so, uh, you know, we've got to be very, very careful about that. So that's what I was talking about there. Oh, by the way, let me just throw, let me just throw another little caveat on that. Internally, cash flow. Right now, everybody, you know, cash loaded. I just make everybody on the webinar kind of give you a cold chill on that. I mean, you talk about cash flow. Um, you know, cash flow is one of the things that keeps me up at night. Uh, we're, our cash flow is fine right now. 
But on the call this morning, we were looking at these grant opportunities with our rent support uh, we were talking about. Well, we know we're okay now, but what about next month? What is it going to look like uh, the month after that? And by the way, a lot of private funders who have support us have gotten a lot of money out in the community to support nonprofits on COVID-19 uh, expenses right now. But they're also telling us that it may, we don't know yet, but it may affect our normal regular giving pattern. We've got to be able to anticipate that. And so I just want to throw that in for your webinar participants on that. We, you got to watch on that. Great point. Um, so a couple people popped in about um, keeping close track to what's going on locally and watching the news um, and mentioned that that's causing them depression or anxiety. And if you have any suggestions on the best way to keep updated and informed while not burdening yourself too much by watching too much. Oh, that's a great question. Again, self-care self starts with me. Uh, I'm a big CNN, that's my personal, CNN, uh, not Fox, not so much, that's just me, uh, CNN, uh, NPR, I'm an NPR, CNN guy. Okay, uh, I watch fl uh, Flipboard, if any of you have Flipboard, I watch uh, uh, Smart News, uh, I have an app, New York Times. I'm not watching any news at night on TV. I'm I'm doing some other. I'm watching English murder mysteries on uh, Netflix, and uh, I'm shutting down at the end of the day, what have you. I'm watching things on my phone, and my phone's getting hit all the time with stuff. I can watch it. I see a headline. If I didn't, I got that off, off, off. I'm trying to really monitor that, and we're communicating that out to our publics uh, in terms of the media interviews I've done. I've had that question come up from the media itself, and I, you know, I had to tell, hey, I'm, we're encouraging people to be very careful about that. I've got to take care of myself, and I'm struggling with my own emotions. And, the, you know, we've got to take – it starts with us. So I'm really watching that. I'm getting up in the morning, my regular time. I'm taking a shower, doing my morning exercise just like I normally do. I'm shaving. I'm getting dressed. I may not be dressed up in my best clothes for work, but I'm getting dressed. I'm not sitting around all day in my clothes. And, and then I'm getting trying to get out when the weather's nice, get outside, get some fresh air. It's a little cool today. If uh, Normally, though, if it's uh, I've been doing a lot of my Zooms from out on my back deck just being outside. I've had a number of people say, I hear the birds chirping, uh, you know, and maybe I I need to mute my phone, but uh, I'm talking so you can hear the birds chirping. But um, anyway, but those, that's a great question. We got to be careful about that, guys, because we can over get overwhelmed ourselves. And if we get overwhelmed, we can't help anybody. Yeah, it's a very fine line, especially nowadays. Um, so another one: any ideas on how to stay connected with volunteers? Someone said all their program leaders are community <laughs> volunteers, so they aren't staff. They've been sending out regular emails and texts, but don't want to overburden anyone. Yeah, I, like I said, I have I've done I had real early on I had I called it uh, communique number one, and just gave a state of the state of the organization what all we're doing just to kind of and I sent out to a lot of funders. Uh, staff, board, advisory. We have an advisory council or an advisory board, some of you may call it. We have that. We have different key funders, our United Way uh, uh, people <clears throat> that we uh, that are important. We sent out, I sent out a communique. Then I sent out a second communique, and I said earlier I need to probably by now formulate a third one. So it just varies about, again, that's that analysis, who's your publics. If you're a vol primarily a volunteer-run organization, Think about them, you know, you know, again, age, their fears, what are their needs. Uh, do some group, but also individualize that. Um, one of my key donors, she and I have over the years, we've been partners for 27 years, all the time since I've been here. <clears throat> she and I talk on the phone, if not every day. Uh, every other or every third day, have a short conversation. How are you guys doing? Your family okay? Yeah, our family's okay. But that's about how it works for me and her. Other donors or board members, it's much more global. So think about what is my normal relationship with that person or that group? How do I have I historically communicated with them? How can I translate that now in COVID-19? I think that will give you your clues on how to be able to do that and being sensitive to not overwhelming them. Great. So that's safety. all we have for questions now, unless you have anything else to add, Mike. Safety comes first. Oh, I'm so 
I, I'm just so impressed with you guys all. And, uh, um, you know, I had to put on there uh, uh, for Bob Dave, my friend Bob Davison, if he's still on, uh, my Spotify playlist, Coping with COVID, uh, is public. You can go and uh, do a search for it and find it. A lot of old school songs on there, and some are humorous, some are fun, some are re- very reflective in mind. So uh, if you have any ideas for that, send it to me. But feel free to call me on my cell phone there or email me. I'd love to talk to you, meet you, help you in any way I can, and I'm sure you can help me also. Great. Thank you so much for sharing with everyone, Mike, and thank you for everyone for joining. And if you had any questions that you weren't able to get in, like Mike said, feel free to shoot him an email, give him a call. Um, I will also be in touch with you all shortly, sending out the link to the recording of this webinar and the slides, um, and you're welcome to respond to that, and I can connect you going forward. So thanks again, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your week, and stay safe and healthy.